Obedient, the main one has to be, yes. So that we can have a bit of a. Sorry? No, 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 no. I mean, please, I mean, stay there. We try to get people here. So we say, yeah. Please, I mean, as you wish, when you sit there. You may take seats uh, if you wish. You may stand. I mean, around. I mean, uh, yeah, have a bit of exchange. So could be polite. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Let's see. We, we may have some other um, uh, chairs so that you know, those who want to mean. Uh, first of all, you are all most cordially welcome to Finnish residence. And I mean, I take I mean, uh, a real statement standing by the Christmas tree to ensure that everyone understands that the Father Christmas comes from Finland. <laughs> <laughs> Even the ones that may contest a bit this occasion. <laughs> So this is, I mean, you, this is, I mean, uh, human rights is your father Christmas. Uh, but I mean, uh, joking aside, uh, as I said, you're most warmly welcome, I mean, to Finnish residents. Uh, a few words about the Finnish approach uh, with regard to uh, human rights in general. Uh, according to our uh, foreign policy approach, human rights are in the center of our foreign policy approach to start with. Uh, and secondly, uh, in our development policy approach and programs, uh, we take so-called human rights-based approach to development. This is, I mean, nothing very peculiar to EU colleagues, because actually this approach is very much, I mean, uh, driven by the EU, I mean, approach mm -hmm. to development and how we should take into account the human rights approach. But we have really implemented this, I mean, literally in, in our development programs, and in our bilateral development I mean, uh, programs as well. So uh, uh, that's, I mean, to give you an understanding where we are, generally speaking. No need to, to say, I mean, that obviously um, in our uh, foreign policy or human rights, I mean, approach or uh, development policy, particular attention is always given to discrimination of vulnerable, vulnerable groups and uh, on promotion of equality in general. Uh, and with regard to LGBTI persons' rights, uh, it is of course uh, a priority area in our human rights approach. Uh, in Geneva, we already discussed them in a bit, uh, we work very closely with like-minded countries on these issues during, uh, I would say during recent year in particular, uh, it has not been very easy environment. Uh, the composition of the present Human Rights Council is such mm. that, I mean, uh, it became very difficult for us uh, to promote these issues. Uh, but luckily, and Finland, I'm sure, EU as well, uh, we are extremely happy that in September Human Rights Council the resolution on sexual orientation was passed. And I mean, if it's not I mean, the strongest language in the world, mm -hmm. it is still very, very important that, uh, politically speaking, that the I main council was able to take this step. Um, we continue to work with our like-minded I mean, countries. Uh, some of them, I mean, uh, from the European Union, not the whole European Union. Uh, some are more active, I mean, on, uh, on these issues than the others. And as, as I said, I mean, uh, then Latin American countries and, uh, and the US. Uh, in Geneva, uh, it is the Netherlands that coordinates, I mean, this work very much. Uh, and I mean, also Denmark is very active, I mean, in coordinating these issues uh, among the so-called like-minded in this area. Uh, with regard, I mean, to another area I want to raise in this relation, which is very, very, very important to my government, is the sexual and reproductive health and rights. Another very controversial issue, 
And I mean, if I raise the uh, recent resolution on sexual orientation, one reason that the I mean, Council was able to uh, adopt that resolution was that all, all references to sexual and reproductive health and rights were obviously abolished. It is a very controversial issue to many countries, uh, but for my country, it is I mean, among uh, big priorities. And we want to, to promote this, I mean, not only, of course, human rights, but I mean, in WHO as well, in, in particular in, in health sector. Uh, overall, of course, I mean, uh, I went a bit away from LGTBI, I mean, uh, focus, but I mean, for us, ending violence and discrimination against individuals uh, on the basis of their sexual orientation and gender identity is of an urgent challenge, uh, which needs to be addressed globally. Uh, and that's what we hope to do. And that's why we look for like-minded partners and, and uh, governments to work with. And I mean, we trust also, uh, as I mean, European Union is represented here, we trust also that European Union remains uh, strong on these issues. As I openly said, it's not always easy uh, for all the dimensions within our group, but I mean, uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, we hope to be a strong voice in this area. Uh, I don't, I mean, want to take too much uh, of your time on, on general issues, which you, uh, most of you know much, much better, I mean, uh, than I do. Uh, just to emphasize that uh, Finland is also very active uh, in our bilateral relations uh, with different countries, I mean, on, on these issues. And as I already said, in our development, I mean, uh, programs, we put focus on these issues and partly uh, our funding is based on the uh, fact that I mean, countries would commit themselves to, to promote uh, equality and non-discrimination non with, with that respect. Well, with regard I mean, to this event in particular, I mean, uh, no need to say again that I mean, working together with global, regional and local civil society organizations and other actors is of great importance to, to my country. Uh, this, e this evening's event is of special nature and it is the first one ever organized together with Penn International on LGBTI uh, rights. I'm extremely happy to welcome I mean, the representatives of Penn, uh, but in particular uh, our guest of hon uh, honor, Mr. Jude Dipi Dipia. Dipi. <laughs> I hope I uh, pronounced it I mean, uh, to somewhat I mean, correct. Uh, you are uh, a famous Nigerian author uh, and you are here to share your experiences on this particular topic, perhaps I mean, even wider, I, I hope. And I mean, without further delay, I would offer first I mean, uh, the floor to Anne, who will I mean, give a bit of background I mean, to this I mean, event and, and our discussions today. Please, Anne, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Ambassador, uh, for your address and also very much for your hospitality in hosting this event tonight. We're very grateful for that and, of course, even more grateful for the very generous support that's been afforded to Penn International with the grant that's been given to us this year to take forward um, developing our work on LGBTQI issues. Um, and I just would like to give a little bit of a background to Penn International for those of you that may not know so much about us. Um, we're an organisation of writers that was founded in 1921, so we are one of the first, if not the first, freedom of expression NGO. Um, we have centres now in over 100 countries, numbering about 150 centres in total, um, composed of writers in those countries who are interested in freedom of expression and literature. Mm -hmm. And we all come together around a charter which states that uh, freedom of expression is key to the transmission of ideas, and that transmission of ideas is fundamental to an understanding of culture, to a promotion of tolerance and respect, and to essentially a promotion of peace and to development in the world. So all uh, members of Penn International sign up to the Charter when they join. <coughs> and uh, I'm the director of the Writers in Prison Committee for Penn International, which uh, basically does a lot of the freedom of expression work. It started in 1960. Um, as a means to defend uh, persecuted writers around the world who are being put in prison for their writings. 
is developed over time to address all people who are persecuted for their use of the written word. We have a case list that where we monitor around 900 cases every year of people put in prison or threatened or killed or otherwise persecuted for their use of the written word. And we also offer a range of practical support to writers who are persecuted, um, offering them grants through our sister organisation, the Pen Emergency Foundation, and also working in partnership with an organisation called the International Cities of Refuge Network that offers placements to persecuted writers who need to leave their countries of origin and find a place in another country where they can actually continue their work, continue their creative writing or their journalism, and also uh, give something back um, about freedom of expression and to raise issues um, in their country as well. Um, and, but this year we've been doing a particular project about LGBTQI rights for the first time, as I said, funded by the, Norwegian, uh, by the Finnish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, I think this came out of um, our realisation and our research that uh, persecution of LGBTQI writers was really on the rise. We saw a number of countries um, bringing in legislation that was anti-gay, anti you know, anti-gay propaganda laws like we saw in Russia, mm -hmm. um, and then all the similar laws being proposed in other countries like mm -hmm. Kyrgyzstan. Obviously, there are laws in Africa, in Uganda, and, and Nigeria, as, as Jude has experienced. And not only that, we then saw cases of persecuted writers um, come into the fore. So in our work with ICORN, the International Cities of Refuge Network, we, did have, we had no cases of LGBTQI writers last year. We've had four this year out of... Um, you know, around 50 cases that we've looked at. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you know, it's a, it's a big rise and we're expecting more. So we realised this was something that we needed to do some work on. Um, and so starting uh, with the Sochi Olympics uh, in the beginning of the year, we had a big campaign about uh, freedom of expression concerns there, including the anti-gay propaganda law. And we uh, had an open letter which was signed by over 50 prominent writers from around the world, Nobel laureates and others, uh, which gained a lot of press and from what we've heard from Russian writers actually engenders a lot of debate about the issue in the country. Um, we had our Congress in Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan this mm -hmm. year, and there's a very similar law there, which is currently before Parliament, and so we were able to use the opportunity of being in Bishkek to do some advocacy with the President. So we had a meeting with the President and others to put our concerns about, uh, about this law and the effects it will have on the LGBTQI community there as well. And um, uh, this is obviously part of this project as well, the next stage, having Jude here to talk about his experiences um, in the African context from Nigeria. And the final piece of this particular project is going to be an anthology of writings by LGBTQI writers, which will be pu published early next year. Um, and of course at the international level, we also very much welcome the resolution that was passed. We think it's very important. And Again, we very much welcome the stance of uh, Finland and others like-minded countries who've uh, promoted that resolution and their unwavering support for the importance of uh, uh, protecting the rights of minorities and people on the basis of their sexual orientation and others. Um, so uh, that's really just what I wanted to say about PEN. There is some information out there, so please help yourself if you're interested. Um, but I would like to move now to introduce our star guest tonight. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have Jude Didier, who's an award-winning Nigerian novelist and writer, whose work over the last decade has touched on themes of sexuality, gender roles, race, and the stigma of HIV AIDS in Africa. He's the author of three novels, Walking with Shadows, Black Sands Books, published in 2005. He was shortlisted for the Association of Nigerian Writers, uh, Ken Sarawira Prize for Prose. He wrote Unbridled, 2007, and Blackbird, 2011. But Walking in Shadows in particular is said to be the first Nigerian novel that has a gay man as its central character, and that treats his experience with great insight, inviting a positive response to his situation. And the acclaimed Kenyan writer, Bimya Banka Wainana, describes him as a pioneer writer in Africa. And he's in conversation tonight with Yaku Kutonti, who's a Finnish writer, Laura, and poet, and he's currently the international treasurer of Penn International. So, I'd like you to... Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne. And I think um, we start now immediately, go straight to the point. I mean, Jude has promised to read us. Um, it's not from from the three books I mentioned, but it's a short story, and it's if you listen to it, you will very 
uh, easily found out that it's connected to the Nigerian law mm -hmm. against the um, Homosexual Marriage Prohibition yeah. Act. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, I'd like to thank the ambassador and Ken for inviting me. And I'm a bit woozy because I'm coming from the US, so I've got um, jet lag a bit. So <laughs> you have to excuse if I make a lot of blunders today. Um, the, the short piece I'm going to read is from a story I wrote after the anti-gay law was passed in Nigeria. And this was like about two or three months after it passed. And a lot of things were happening, and I thought I could document them in the short story form. So um, I'm not, I've never read this out in public before, so I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> OK, it's titled um, The Way We Were. You hate stories that end badly. This is why you avoid reading the news. Too much pain, too much suffering, and seldom hope. Every day is a new challenge. You wake up, wear your mask, and like a masquerade, compelled to dance in the village square. You dance this dance of existence. Dance, twirling round and round in a dizzying spin and life is but a merry-go-round of endless repetition. But you breathe, you eat, and you sleep, with one eye open, afraid, always afraid, that someone will wrench your mask off, or it may slip off, and you're revealed for, what, for who you truly are. And then, there will be blood, blood like a river, with no beginning, and no end in sight. There will be no bad endings today if you can help it. But sadly, you don't control your fate. Tonight, you will sleep with your two eyes open. Tomorrow, you will fasten your mask tightly around your face and go about your business. Your neighbors smile awkwardly at you, and you smile back. Good morning, you say to them. They nod and shuffle away. The women herd their children away as if protecting them from a predator. Masquerades scare children. You have no children of your own, and you are aware of the whispers. Why is a grown man not married? What kind of man does not have a female companion or visitors? The whispers have become louder since January. In January, a flock of your friends quickly rushed to the altar to proclaim, I do. January was the month things changed. One morning in January, you overheard people in your place of work praising the government for taking a bold step and giving the middle finger to the West and all countries that champion gay rights. In January, while you slept, someone snuck in and cracked your mask. A young man died yesterday. He was murdered. His mother found him strangled in his room. She recalled he came home late at night with a male friend of his and told her he had already had dinner. She let him be and left him with his guests. In the morning when he did not come down for breakfast, she thought he had overslept again. She found him with his belt tied round his neck, lying in a puddle of feces and urine. She knew he was gone forever. You see the news on Facebook. You hide to read the you hide to read the solid story. You are appalled that no one really cares that a young man just died. All people seem interested in is how come he came home with a man, and why his mother left him have a man in his bedroom late at night. Didn't she know better? Didn't she know about the law that January brought? She was a careless mother. Her son obviously deserved what he got. He met a, he met a stranger online and brought him to his house. Every fool knew that you could not do that anymore, not after January. You want to go somewhere private and weep, not just because a young man died, but that these wounding words come from pious religionists but mostly because the source of many of these hateful comments were written by people like you. 
let the victim. You realize your own people are far less forgiven than they should be. You realize that attitudes never change. Why paradigms refuse to, to shift. No one is willing to take off the mask of the bear and stand firmly for what is right and just. All everyone wants to do is dance. Dance. Dance until the sun sets. Dance until the river turns red. The days pass and you hear of many more tragedies. Men are dragged out from their beds, stripped naked and made to parade the street. People laugh and point at them. Their pictures appear online with rude headlines while the world sleeps and tons of land eye to this. This is not big enough to grab the world's headlines. There was a video you came across on the web as well of two men forced to engage in carnal intercourse while people whipped them and jeered at them, cursing them for loving themselves, hating them for loving. Can't you see their actions seem to say, love died in January, love died while you were sleeping. You don't hear from your lover in many days and you worry. Is he okay? Was he ambushed like the unfortunate man you've read about? Against your will, you're forced to check online for news of more lynchings and entrapments of young men, praying you do not come across his name. You realize that most of the blogs and online forums run by people like you have mysteriously vanished. People are free and going far on the ground. It seems to you that they are digging graves to hide in. You search the regular news sites and read of another young man found dead on, the, on a campus. He hung himself in news stated. You wonder if he was like you. You wonder if he simply gave up. It's Friday and you get a call. You don't recognize the number and wonder if you should answer it. The ringer is persistent and you succumb. It is him. He is safe. But your, your relief is ephemeral. He tells you he's getting married. He will, he will get married before, January, before the January mob come knocking at his door. He, had had, he already had a taste of it when the police stopped him and seized his phone and laptop. He was told he looked funny, that his jeans were too tight for a man. They threatened to take him to the station for interrogation if he did not let them check the content of his telephone and laptop. He escaped the intimidation by parting with the big bribe, but they took his cell number to keep in touch, they tell him. So he got a new one and retired the number he usually called him with. People were already talking about him, he says. He could not risk being discovered. So how did our story end, you ask? We live, we live he tells you. We survive. But what if we take off our mask and fight, you say? He tells you your right, your right to exist was taken away in January. He says goodbye. Goodbye to freedom. January came and took everything away. Now when you wake up every day, you wish for things to return to the way they were. First time reading it out. <laughs> Thank you, Chu. It was a touching text indeed. Uh, but I, I, I propose we, we enter now a, a time machine uh, and go uh, ten years back to, yeah. to your first novel, uh, Walking with Shadows, which was published in 2005, so almost ten years ago. And uh, <clears throat> I just read it and I was impressed by, first of all, of its high, high literary quality. It's Thank you. Very Touching, touching text. It tells the story of of a gay man who has, so to say, gone back back to closet. He used to have an open gay identity, but then uh, later he got married and is now living uh, a bourgeois life with a family and yeah. career. And then what happens is that his secret is revealed and, and the and so there's a crisis in, in his life. And that's how the story begins. But even 
as much as much as I was I was impressed by the literary quality, I was impressed by the prophetic nature of it. It's like it's written ten years ago, but it seems to anticipate what's going on in Nigeria now. Like going into very details, like uh, you tell about how gay men decide to leave Nigeria because the, the pressure is just too much to yeah. to to stand. So so please tell us how did you how did you how did you become a writer? How did you got the idea for that book and how did you end up writing like that? It's, I mean I know you know, first time is always important and for a writer first book is always yeah. I mean, somehow special. So tell well, us the story. I think writing for a lot of people comes um, in different forms. I grew up in a time there was no internet, mm. there was no Facebook, um, we didn't have cable TV back home, there was no 24 hours television cycles and, and things like that. So you go to school, you come back and um, children TV starts at four o'clock in the afternoon and by then we're doing um, assignments and homework and by five you watch TV, by seven adult TV starts with the news and everything. So we didn't have the distractions we had in these days. And then I, I, I also was a very, um, what's the word? I was a very shy kid. I didn't mix well with other children. So the silliest I had was reading books. And my dad had a library, what I mean, a huge library in the house where we had all sorts of books, um, English texts, um, the great Russian writers, the great American writers. And, you know, so it was just fun just discovering all this literature and just reading. Um, but I think that the, the thing about literature is it allows you to experience other people's realities. You know, before I started traveling, I knew about America, I knew about Europe, and um, how the people lived, and how their lives were. And of course we had the television that was more or less American propaganda. So back home in Nigeria, the only thing you saw as a kid was Sesame Street and the Famous Five and, you know, everything was very much American. There was very little content that actually tackled um, being African or black. And then there was hardly any content that tackled being different or queer or gay. And as a child, I had no language for, the, for who I was. I, I just knew I was different. So when I became an adult, I started searching extensively for literature that would talk about me as a black person in my society. And um, it's just something to tell me that I wasn't evil, that the Bible, what the Bible says that you're going to hell wasn't true, you know, stuff like that. And um, of course I grew up Catholic, so I was really conflicted as a child. So I, I was just looking for any kind of literature that would address Judea as a human being with the feelings that I had, you know, as a kid, I was different, I, I knew I was different, but I had no idea what it was. And so I grew up, went to, you know, high school, and then when I graduated um, the university, back then I'd written a short novella, I already had the book for writing, but I still kept on searching for literature that addressed um, gay sexuality in the African context, it wasn't there. And one of my greatest, um, Admirers, um, a person I admire, you know, a lot is Toni Morrison, and she did say, "If it's a book that you want, you must read that hasn't been written, then write it." So I was on a mission. I said, "Okay, if it hasn't been written, I have to write something to explain who I was to a wider audience." And around that period of time, I also came across um, a novel by an American writer, Helen Harris, black gay writer. And for the first time in my life, I could see characters that, t that spoke to me, you know, the struggles and everything. I just felt, oh my God, finally. But this is America, this is not Africa still. But I could relate to the characters. And um, luckily, that was in the early 2000s, about, about 2000, I think. Internet had just come into Nigeria. I didn't have a personal computer, but I was working. So when I go to the office, I could Google and read up stuff. And so one day I searched for Helen Harris and I was directed to his website. On his website, I got his email address and I was like, oh, that's interesting. And so I write to him and I say, well, I am an aspiring writer and I've read one of your books and I was so impressed. It tackled issues that I'm interested in as a writer and um, I hope to write something like this in future. And um, a week later, 
I get a response from Elon Harris telling me, you know, I shouldn't give up, I should write, and I mean, it was so, such an encouraging um, stuff for me as a, as a young person at the time. And um, at, after, after he said that, he sent me about four or five copies of his novels, all autographed. That gave me like the fuel I needed to write my novel and finish it. But then coming back to writing the book, um, I was very much in denial growing up, and um, I did everything that most gay people were doing here. As in, I tried to act straight. I was, um, I was seeing a lady at the time who I thought I was going to get married to, and um, I introduced her to my family. Everybody loved her, and she was a really nice person. But I felt very guilty inside. I, I kept thinking that I'm going to hurt this person one day. I'm going to hurt this person one day, and so all the questions started. What if? You do get married to this woman, you do have a lovely family, and then your secret is revealed. How does that affect you as a person, affect her, and affect your family? And so that's how I got the idea for the novel. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> so, um, just to reveal more, but I think you also could read that book and go and yeah. find it. You can buy it as an e book from iTunes, for example. But what I found very touching was not only the, the how it described the feelings of, of a young gay man in Nigeria, but also people around him, yeah. like like his wife, his friends, friends of his wife. Yeah. When, when when the secret started to to to, yeah. to first as a rumor, and then suddenly everyone knew. And so it's not just a story of the gay man, but it's a story yeah. of, of uh, Nigerian society as it yeah. st stands. But, uh, I mean, what, what happened then? I mean, yeah. did you, uh, did, were there some consequences of, of writing such a book? I know that it wasn't easy, easy to be yeah. published, but it, you know, it kind of made so, itself yeah. like, known. And it's still a steady seller as we say, yeah. book world. The thing is, Thank you. The thing is, with, with writing Walking with Shadows, um, I'm grateful I wrote the book first, because at the time I wasn't like a seasoned writer that was obsessed with rules and techniques and structure and all of this, those things you have to think about as a writer. Uh, I wrote it from a different place. I wrote it from a place of exploration and hurt and, and discovery. Mm. So I wasn't thinking of all of that, but what I thought about at the time was what kind of image do people have of, of gay people in general, especially back home? And um, the narrative of a gay man or gay woman in, in Nigeria or Africa widely is they are possessed, evil, um, either they are predators or pedophiles or, you know, everything that had anything to do with same-sex sexuality was demonized in such a way that nobody had a different narrative. And so I was very conscious of that. And the second thing was that gay people are always sexualized. If you ask um, mm -hmm. a normal person back home, mm -hmm. what's your idea of a homosexual? I can guarantee you one on one that they will tell you a man and man having sex, or a woman and woman having sex. And if you ask the same person, what's your definition of a heterosexual? They would not describe them in sexual terms, mm -hmm. you know? So those are the things I was very conscious of when I was writing, writing the novel. And so I said, okay, you're writing this book, you can't write about gay sex. It has to be off topic because that's not the issue. Mm -hmm. We need to educate people on what a gay person is, a normal thing that they go through. And there's a passage in my novel, which he wants me- It would be great if you could read Yeah, he wants me to read. One of the best yeah. <laughs> the, At the end of the book, um, the wife was slowly coming to, you know, understand who Adrian was, that's the, 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 the husband. And she still found it difficult to embrace him as a gay man, but she was more forgiving. So he asks her, what's your idea of, of, of a gay person? And she says the same thing. People of the same sex having sex. And so he says, that's not it. You know, I can be gay without having sex. And so he just reads her how he felt internally mm -hmm. to say, this is what it is to be gay, you know. And, uh, even when Wayne was true with it, she still didn't understand. She says, I don't understand, but I would not judge you. And I wouldn't allow my daughter to judge you either. You know, things like that. 
So I was very conscious of all those little issues that we had, and then I didn't want to use a singular stereotype of one man. So like he said, I had his friends, I had other people, I had some lesbian women as well who were married to men, who were trying to help the white to understand what it was to be married to a gay man, you know, and things like that. So it was, um, I, I think I was taking a whole lot in. But coming back to your original question was reception, I, I was taking a risk, but I was young and, you know, maybe stupid or, you know, overly excited about the whole project of writing. I didn't think of any consequences of anything happening to me at the time. And while um, homophobia was still very rampant in Nigeria, there was no law in place that criminalized gay people. There was just no law. So if you're educated, you could find a way to navigate yourself out of that situation. If you're not educated, it's a bit more difficult. But if you're educated, you can talk your way out of it. And because it's so simple, at that, before, before the law was passed, you need to either have physical proof of somebody having sex with the same sex person, either a picture or a videotape, which will be rare to find. So if you're smart, you can talk your way out of anything. But when the law was passed, now, as in currently, it changed a lot of things. What it means is that to be gay, you're a criminal. Mm. You know, it's empowered um, the police, it's empowered mob actions in the country. We've seen that. The excerpt I, I read just now was based on actual events that has happened after the law was passed that troubled me. And I was reading all these things on the internet and discovering what was happening to people and I was outraged and I said, okay, how do I document this? So I, I wrote the story just to remember, you know. So, what was the question again? I think I was talking about the point. I know it has to do with reception, but, but I mean, yeah, I have one, one further question. Yeah. Why do you think, I mean, why do you think the, the law, which I think all of you here know the, the, direct, mm. the, the, the content of it, it's, I mean, I mm. think, the previous uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights mm -hmm. somehow uh, said about it that really have I seen a piece of legislation that in so few paragraphs directly violates so many basic universal human rights. So it's a, quite an accom accomplishment indeed. But why, was, why now? Why now? Why, why now? Is it a reaction, sort of like in, in many European countries, the laws have been liberalized? Or, you know, I, more I was, and more. Is it the reaction against that, or I think, is there I think, some other reason we I think are not aware of? I think there's part of it, but truthfully, I can't answer that truthfully to say that this is what it is. This is so complex. There's so many issues involved. There's the out. There's the rejection of Western laws and rules and, and whatever. Um, I can give you a good example of things people tell me back home when I was in Nigeria. Is how dare the Americans talk to us about? gay rights in, in Nigeria, whereas in their country they still kill gay people. In their country not all the states do recognize gay people as legally whatever, you know. So there's a bit of double standard there, you know. So there's that outrage. There's also the gay people have always been scapegoated in the past. If there's a crisis in the country, let's say a minister has discovered stealing money or there's a scandal somewhere, to divert people's attention, you bring up this gay issue again, and everybody just, you know, unites against the gay people. So it's, it's a tool that's always been used time and time, and we've seen it almost every time, come and go, come and go, come and go. But what we've never seen before was a law. Now it's a law, which means that you're basically taking away their freedom to express themselves, their freedom to be who they are, you know? So I think that's the, the scary part of the whole thing. I, I can't really say this is one thing, this is what it is. It's just, there's so many things involved in it. Yeah. So, I mean, as we in Penn, we know all too well that the most powerful form of censorship is self-censorship. Yeah. And that comes very often through fear. Yeah. And I mean, even if there were no cases of this laws being applied, then I mean, it might have accomplished what it wants to accomplish the, the sort of silencing of gays going back to yeah. closet. Do you think that's the that's what they actually want to do? Uh, you can be what you are but stay in the closet. I, I wish it was they could have done that with a law. Mm -hmm. 
you know, because what it means is um, I hate you. I can go to the police and say, I suspect Yaku is gay. Mm -hmm. In fact, I saw him with a man last night. Mm -hmm. I saw him kissing a man last night. You know, they could have done whatever. And you know, when we talk about, and I've said this earlier to you today, when we talk about gay rights and freedom in, in Africa or Nigeria, it's totally different from what is being discussed in the US or Europe. Totally different. Mm -hmm. What um, gay people really want is to be recognized as human beings and respected as that. They are not asking for marriage. Nobody has ever asked for that. They are not asking for the rights to adopt children. They are just asking for the basic rights to be human and to live. So when we have discussions of, when I listen to other Europeans or Americans talk about gay rights and the progress they've made and how come they can have um, legal rights to you know, have children, or, you know, and I'm like, wow, this is so not what we're discussing in Africa because we haven't gotten to that stage yet. And maybe that's what's confusing the African leadership because they see all of this and they're thinking, ah, very, if we allow this to happen, these people will come back tomorrow and say, we want children, we want marriage, we want this, but I don't think we're there yet. People are still trying to love themselves and accept who they are. And it's such a struggle to be, to be gay and to be African. It's such a huge struggle. So I think what they really want is just let me be. Do not judge me, do not kill me, do not imprison me, do not take away my freedom. That's all they're asking. And it's not the same thing that we discuss in Europe or the US. Okay, so we are here with our first world problem. Exactly. <laughs> That's how it usually goes. But then, yeah. I mean, how would you advise us? I mean, what would be the, the best strategy for us to, to help people in Nigeria? I mean, let's say, like PEN or other NGOs or UN or, or you know, diplomats. I mean, it's, it's, I found that it's very often counterproductive if we start telling Africans that you should be like that and have laws like that. I mean, um, what should be the uh, I, I think, way of acting? And this is not talking for anybody, this is personal opinion. First, they need to de emphasize um, public announcements on rights. I think, how do I phrase this? I think dialogue should continue, but things like giving ultimatums and threats and well, sanctions, and, and sanctions. Yeah, don't they, they, they don't work. <clears throat> it only endangers more people's lives at the end of the day. We've discovered, I mean, I, I talked to some gay advocates back in Nigeria and they say, you know, there are some people in, 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 in government who actually support the gay people but unfortunately, they can't do anything. They can't say anything. And I'm thinking, if we're having dialogue with the government on a separate level that's not public, non big public, maybe things would change quicker. But when you have people like, I have to use this example again, like America saying, oh, we're going to sanction this, but we're going to stop this, or the UK government saying, we're going to stop giving aids to um, the Nigerian government. Going to, you know, all that, they don't care. The Nigerian government has enough oil wealth not to really care about what other people think, unfortunately. But that's just the truth, you know. So what we probably need are leaders who can actually come together with them in private and sit down and say, okay, what are your problems? How can we deal with this? And slowly begin to change the laws. Maybe that might help, that's personal opinion. You mean local leaders? Local leaders, yes. Leaders here, everywhere, I will come back and say, okay, and work with the local NGOs as well. Because there's always something about foreign aid that aches the government. It's, to them it sounds a bit condescending, mm -hmm. you know? And I guess maybe it's a backlash of the whole colonial yeah, sure. history that we've had or whatever. Mm -hmm. But then again, the same government are the ones that embrace the things like the Bible and the Quran, which are totally foreign to our culture. Because that's one of the, the tools that they used to fight, always against the African culture against the African culture. In the Bible, it said, you know, and you begin to wonder, but the Bible is so foreign to our culture as well, so. It's, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, let's now give voice to our audience. Any questions? May I, I mean, before we go to, okay. I, I don't want to push anyone to take the floor, but I would be very happy if Christina would I mean, say a few words on, on I mean, the European Union approach. 
Yes, um, of, of course. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the invitation, first of all, Ambassador, and uh, for the opportunity we have to um, be able to, to listen to, to two writers, in fact, um, tonight. Um, basically, the EU, and I'm very glad that you, you, you mentioned also the wish that we, we should stand um, firm on, um, on, um, on our um, policy to protect and to promote rights of uh, minorities and of uh, uh, LGBTI persons. This is something what, uh, what we try. Um, maybe you know that since uh, 2012 we have a sort of uh, internal strategy within the EU that tries to, um, to look at the, uh, the human rights policy of the next year. There, of course, LGBTI um, is a major um, um, uh, pillar, let's say, for us, and so this is something um, we will really put emphasis on. Um, as was mentioned also before, the SOGI resolution that was passed in, in September in the HRC was, of course, a big thing for us, positive one. Um, we are also very glad, I don't know if some colleagues from uh, some Latin American countries are here, that um, this was being done together with another continent, so it was a cross-regional thing. Um, that was important, not because we did not want to take the lead, but um, the composition of the council is such that you need to do it in a cross-regional uh, initiative. You cannot do it alone. So um, we are very happy for that. I must say we were also quite um, uh, relieved that uh, one of our um, African friends, um, mm -hmm. uh, South Africa, <laughs> voted in favor. Um, that was good. And uh, we tried to engage with them also <laughs> and to continue that. And um, so to reassure you, it's one of our, really of our main policies. Indeed, there are some differences in between the 28, but uh, diversity yeah. is something that is good and is something that is also one of the characteristics of the European Union. Mm -hmm. So it is good that the 28 are not uh, equal or not, I mean, not um, totally um, um, thinking along totally the same lines, but we are united in, uh, in our wish to... In our diversity. We are united in our diversity, <laughs> be it language, be it um, minorities, be it... Um, <coughs> you name it. So, and, and, and thanks a lot for this opportunity that um, we have to... We don't have this opportunity very often, I have to say very often, we are, I have two colleagues here, so they can for sure um, say that as well. We are quite in an abstract...